for our next speaker, uh, uh, Roy Yaron from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem in Israel, is going to talk about optimizing SVM for systems with periodic boundary conditions. Hey, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Great. Um, and is the presentation, uh, can you see it? Y yes, we can see it. Uh, right, uh, you have uh, 25 minutes so that we can have five minutes for questions. Uh, if you like, I can let you know five minutes before your time is up. Oh, okay. uh, all right. Great, so I will start. Um, okay, so hey, I'm, I'm Roy from uh, Hebrew University and I will present uh, a research uh, like a work that I've been working on in the last uh, year. Uh, under the supervision of uh, Professor Neil Barnea in collaboration of uh, Betzal Bozak and uh, Martin Schaeffer at the Hebrew University. Um, the topic is going to be optimizing uh, SVM, which is a stochastical version method in a box. Um, so I will really start by giving a short review of what I'm going to talk about in the next 25 minutes. Uh, so I will start by giving some uh, motivation of why, um, uh, why we are interested in uh, periodic bound uh, boundary condition calculation. It well, the reason is going to be to get some deeper understanding of uh, lattice QCD result. Uh, after that, we'll show what is the uh, stochastical version or method algorithm. It's actually going to be uh, present again uh, tomorrow by, uh, uh, by Bloom uh, at one of the lectures. Um, and then you might have some, uh, some more, some other opportunity to uh, review it again. After that, we'll uh, speak about how SVM uh, works in a, in a box, which is like in a boundary, a periodic boundary condition, and uh, like how it has been done up to now is in a few uh, works that has been done in this field. And then I will show a few optimization that I will, was working on to actually make those uh, algorithm to be uh, more uh, like faster and more efficient. Um, so I will start with really the motivation of why we're interested in a periodic boundary condition. Uh, so I, I will start by saying, like, I, I guess that most of you are like know uh, that QCD is like a quantum homodynamic is actually uh, the most, uh, like what it is, it's a very like fundamental theory with that uh, allow us to describe uh, interaction between quarks and gluons. And it actually has a problem, which it's uh, non-perturbative and uh, low energy, unlike uh, QD, where you can just uh, use Feynman uh, diagram and, and just have a description, uh, which is perturbative and, and much simpler. In uh, QCD and low energy, you actually cannot have a fast uh, approach to how to perturbatively do it. And that's why you, we need to do lattice, uh, uh, this lattice gauge theory simulation, which are really some kind of a bolt force where you actually have a really like you need to have some pretty big box with a space uh, like a small spacing between it uh, which describe your space and and on it to to make your calculation uh, now because there's many like sizes with different magnitudes of order uh, then this task becomes quite hard uh, to, to be done and, and in general if you have uh, in uh, infinitely large box, box and infinitesimally like small distance between points, then QCD uh, result should be recovered, but it's it's quite hard to, to do it. And in general, those calculations are many times done in boxes which are not large enough. And that's why there is a need for some theory that will allow us to, to really clean this those box effect. And as I will show uh, uh, like later on in the lecture, th those models are not very simple and, and I will and I will show like a, a one that we are working on which have some uh, some bottlenecks of, of why it's uh, it's like complicated to, to make those uh, calculation which which estimate what is really the effect of this box um, so I will start by showing some result that is being uh, already done first of all yet uh, like by uh, lattice QCD people uh, here, the, there are like uh, Deutron and Helium 4 uh, by a, a NPL QCD collaboration. 
on like different box sizes. And here, like this line has been taken from uh, work that has been done by Moti Eliao, which is a former uh, student of, uh, of my supervisor. And here he actually really created some uh, model using a factory field theory, which, which exactly gives this like estimation of, of how, uh, what should be uh, the energy of, of uh, those system with any uh, box uh, size for both of those. Um, so, can I ask yes. a question? Right. Yes. Uh, is that at physical pion masses? Mm. Uh, those, no, it's uh, not no. physical pion masses. Okay. Because they're uh, really overbound, right? Yeah. It's, uh, this is uh, exactly the reason. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So, I will continue with describing the physical. Uh, um, system that we are going to deal with. It's uh, just for the, I uh, will have some assumption for the simplicity of uh, this calculation. We'll have here, uh, here some potential, which is between every uh, pair of particle. In general, as you actually have asked uh, uh, before, we would need to do a two body force in the works itself. It, it is being done, but just for the simplicity of this lecture, I will ignore it. And I will not uh, take into account the spin and isospin component. And, uh, and the angular momentum of the problem, because anyway, it's a risk. We're searching for ground state, so it's not uh, really needed. So uh, let, let's start by really speaking about what are the states of the system that we're going to, uh, to describe, uh, like the base states that we, we will use later on. So here we have some type of Gaussian. Here, those axes are a vector. A is a matrix. Um, and it is being defined, and S is a, yeah, and S is a vector as well, and it's being defined so that uh, those sums will, uh, will look like this. Actually, this part defines the distance between each pair of particle, like A is being defined by those Dij parameters, which, uh, which give us the uh, distance between particle I and J. And this uh, part actually describes the distance of particle uh, of each particle from point number S with this width uh, delta E. Um, now, because we are, uh, we can extend it to three dimension here with poson one by just multiplying it uh, in all of three direction. And just to see that you, uh, that everything was clear up to now, then like some, some question take uh, like some time if you need and then ask and answer in the chat of how many parameter do you think I need in, in order to define each of the, like this uh, basis state? Are, are you having some technical difficulties? No, I was, yes, so I just wanted to give people some type of thing. Now we can, I will just continue. Um, so, just a second. Okay. Yeah. So you can see this uh, that actually we have n multiplied by n minus one divided by two pairs of particle, which is uh, defined uh, by this part. And we have two n from the center of each point and this width. And this is the amount of parameters that we need to describe each state. Um, now, the egg will need to, will like to find the ground state of, uh, of some finite basis. I, uh, I will explain what it means in a second. We have some uh, k different, if we're given a k different uh, parameter, we'd like to be able to know, uh, to, to like some, um, span some uh, estimation of our ground state by that. And there's a method of how to do that. Um, we actually solve this begin value problem where H uh, is a matrix that's being defined by uh, the matrix element of the states and B is like the overlap between them. And if, and you can actually see that if, if you're looking at a state, which is a linear combination of those, it should be, um, a solution of this uh, eigenvalue 
uh, of, of this eigen value problem and actually by solving it you, you can get actually like the lowest um combinate like the lo lowest estimation of uh the of the lowest of estimation of the energy using those um functions um and by really variational principle we can uh, if we add like more and more basis state which allows us to span uh, like more and more accurately the uh, the ground state that we're looking for then we can actually approach this number and approximate it and from here we can really like move to what this svm it is being described in uh, the book of valga and suzuki and you can look uh, there afterwards for more details uh, but in general it's just algorithm to select those uh, wave function parameters uh, to minimize uh, uh, the ground state. Uh, we will use analytically solvable um, uh, metric settlement, uh, which means that actually when we'll calculate uh, the inner product between them or like this thing, we'll, we'll use an integral that is not, will not like integrate uh, numerically, we'll just have some express, expression that we can write and use, which will be make the calculation faster for the computer. And uh, We'll use a non-orthogonal basis because it's uh, Gaussian and, and the overlap between them is not zero, and that's why this like uh, matrix is is actually needed. Um, so from here, let's uh, let's really discuss of how this uh, SVM is working. So, given a group of k different uh, basis states, uh, the, the way that we'll actually like extend our basis that will first of all create a random state. Uh, with random parameters and then run C0 time where C0 is some uh, parameter of the algorithm. And C0 time will run actually over each one of those R parameters that we had uh, earlier that describe the space state. And each time we'll take a one, uh, one parameter, let's say DK, and we'll create M0 candidates of what should be uh, this parameter, like which will be randomly selected. And for each of those, we'll actually recalculate again what, uh, given this, um, given uh, this, uh, uh, the state, what should be uh, H and B, those uh, two metri uh, those two matrices that actually define our, our system. And we'll find the uh, solution of the ground uh, of, of the uh, generalized Eigen value problem and get by that the uh, lowest energy that it's possible using those states. And we'll save the uh, candidate that will have the lowest energy. And by doing that, we can actually get, um, uh, we'll repeat this procedure uh, many times as being like uh, shown here. And eventually we should get the state which should like really like decrease uh, quite well uh, our, our energy and we can get states which really describe uh, what should be our expected ground state um, of, uh, eventually. Now, all of this thing actually assume that we know how to calculate those like metric elements quite fast because we need to repeat it lots of time. So we'll show, uh, first of all, how in one dimension uh, this calculation like generally look like. So BIJ, this overlap uh, between two system in uh, one dimension is, is actually it's just the integral between minus infinity to infinity. Now those two functions are Gaussians, and I will not show like specifically what is going to be the formula. I think it just give it it might uh, just confuse and, and not be and be too technical. But there is some some really like formula uh, that is known, and, and the uh, computer know how to calculate uh, really fast for that. And if we'd like to calculate the uh, Hamiltonian, then uh, we'll actually need to uh, calculate the sum of both of those operators on uh, 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 right here, like the matrix elements of those. And for example, if we would like to calculate the energy, then we can just take the uh, like two pairs of state, put this in the middle. Eventually, this is just like to de derive twice uh, some Gaussian, so which uh, Gaussian multiplied by a polynomial, which is still something which is analytically, cal analytically calculatable. And we'll have this uh, nice expression. Uh, similar, you can do with uh, VIJ. I will leave a, like uh, I'm sure that you that you can understand why it's not really different. Now, from here, moving to uh, 3D matrix elements is 
is something that you can derive directly. We just need to uh, put that, put like more, because we're dealing with Gaussian, then actually the relation between them is just multiplication and we can actually separate the integrals of each axis. I will not show it, but, uh, uh, but, but it is a, a really like a interesting proof. Um, from here, we'll uh, go directly to how actually the box is affecting our system. So that is QCD calculation are really being done in a box in periodic boundary condition. And let, let's understand for a second what it actually means. Uh, in the most like simple uh, uh, example in one dimension, if we have like a one dimension line, which is periodic, we'll get some ring. And you can look here, for example, and it actually means that uh, each particle will uh, experience an interaction not only with like the, uh, the normal uh, location of the particle, but actually each projection, uh, each um, moving it, each um, module of this thing by L. What do I mean? Uh, if the uh, A and B, uh, particle number A will experience that there is a, a particle and distance out, out of L, but as well another you will experience particle in distance of R minus L. You could experience another in the distance of R plus L. And I can do it like as much times as I want. Um, sorry. And using this uh, idea, we can actually understand that we'll have to, su uh, to sum over all possible um, shifts um, or in, in the potential in order to fully calculate it. And as well, from the same reason, actually, the wave function uh, will have to be uh, the same after we move it by a distance of L. Um, so in order to get this symmetry, we'll actually sum it by either, uh, every possible shift of an integer number uh, multiplied by L in each one of, for each one of the particles, as you can see here. Um, this idea has actually been uh, firstly given by uh, uh, Yin and Bloom uh, eight years ago, um, and has been first uh, used for a uh, lattice uh, to uh, uh, describe lattice QCD something like a year ago uh, uh, by uh, uh, by really Moti and this work that I uh, spoke about before. Um, now let's move to how really this thing affects the metric element calculation. The fact that we have a box now. And uh, here there is a quite of like a complicated um, statement, which I'm not going to go through in any detail. Just there is, uh, I, I will just like say the main point that you can see. And if someone have afterward like more time, you can look and, at this like slide and, and think about it. There's actually a really like a, a, a really interesting idea. But the point is uh, here we have a function which goes between a, a our uh, world is between like a zero and L. And that's why this is like the, our inner product. And we have here both of the summation. And actually we can uh, re uh, get rid of one of the summation and replace the uh, integration of, uh, between zero to L to integration between minus infinity and to infinity. And that's what will bring us this uh, final, uh, th this final integral, which is again, something which is uh, numerically uh, like uh, calculatable analytically. Um, from here, um, we, we should notice that there is something which is problematic, which is the fact that we need to solve, uh, to sum over infinitely amount of like shift of those box. And what we actually do in order to calculate those things in computer is to cut it in some value that we'll call B max, like them, and minus B max to the other direction. And eventually we have like two B max plus one a shift that we'll have to do for each axis. And that will bring us this final result, which is some analytically solvable uh, formula that we have to uh, make for each one of those uh, different shifts. And now for the potential energy, we can do some pretty similar tricks, but here we'll have slightly more, um, slightly more sh uh, shifts and ingredients that we'll, have to ha that we'll have to include because we have as well the potential with the ha which have, uh, which we can do in every shift as well. And we need to consider the potential between each pair of particle. Um, but eventually we have as well, like some analytically solvable uh, functions we need to repeat on many times. Uh, now let's 
deal with what is really the, the time complexity of, of each of the calculation of those metrics elements. And now I will, I, I will not really, I, I don't have much time to uh, wait, wait for an answer of how much calculations of those there will be. So I'll just run about it really fast. The amount of, we have N multiplied by N minus one divided by two pairs of particle. And this is the amount of shift per axis. And we need to do a, it over N different particle and over the potential, which here add this a, N plus one uh, power. And this gives us the amount of time that we really need to do this function uh, to, to, uh, to run this function in order to get the metric set up. Now, the potential is, is really the most demanding uh, metrics uh, element. It, and it's kind of the bottleneck of this whole uh, procedure. Because if we like compare SVM outside of the box and SVM inside the box, like out, uh, then outside of the box, we don't need to have so much like different uh, summation. And this was really some, some problem that we faced that make those calculation uh, run really slow. And when really like there was a need to, to make those, then two or three particle was kind of possible. But uh, when this method has been tried, it has been extended to a four particle, and it took something like really few months to, to get some results. And they were not that accurate because it was uh, uh, hard to do that. And I will show for it uh, really fast, like a demonstration of how, uh, how the converging of SVM calculation looks here. It's been taken from a work uh, that is being done uh, by some of the people who are doing the lattice QCD result by themselves. They actually used this, uh, like the, took this approach as, uh, as well and calculate here uh, for some two body system and uh, the converging of the, uh, of, of, the, of one of the ground state. And you can see that after something like 50 basis states, uh, you get a good description of, of, of it. And it's, it's quite converged, at least at this scale. Um, anyway, this was what was done up to now. And from here, I will show like the, the optimization that I did on this work in order to really make it uh, faster and, and more accurate to, to kind of open this uh, four body bottleneck. So, the first thing is using a dynamic uh, Bmax value. Bmax is actually the, uh, th this amount of summation that we do. And as I said before, there is actually a lot of candidates that are being uh, examined before we actually take some uh, basis, uh, basis state and say like, okay, we chose it. The number is being written here. This is the amount of parameters. This is the amount of time that we run over each of them. And it's something between typically 100 to 5,000. It's a lot. And actually, most when we calculate an energy for, for a candidate, most of the error adds up from errors in, uh, in all of the matrix element, not only like the new ones that has been added by the candidate. And if you actually understand uh, that most of the error in this calculation, in those matrix elements comes from a too small value of B max, which dictates not only the accuracy, but the runtime as well, then you can actually get to the point that if you want, that, that you can actually get much uh, more efficient uh, uh, work if you would actually using, use a smaller Bmax value uh, for candidates uh, before they're actually being stored. It means that, that we'll use a, a smaller like accuracy in order to compare between different states uh, to see who has like lower energy. Uh, and it could, uh, and maybe we'll get like slightly diff, uh, less optimized states, but we'll get much faster result. And uh, this could save like something like 10 times, 50 times, like uh, of, of the running time, because of like really most of the time are those candidates. And if we uh, right. take this. You have a couple mm -hmm. of minutes to conclude. Okay. And <laughs> um, I'm, I'm really close to the end. Uh, and we can actually extend this idea even further. Um, and calculate kind of layer by layer um, th those, uh, th the summation over the box, which means that uh, we can actually, for a candidate, just each time, if at the beginning we would look, uh, we can actually uh, add, like, uh, add one to Bmax each time, see if it actually increase the, uh, in increase the result. And if the change is really neglectable, then we'll stop and not add any more of those. And this is another way to save time. 
The second thing, uh, and the last thing we'll talk about is using Jacobi coordinates. Now, I guess that all of you know what it is. It's just a more natural coordinate system to separate the center of mass. And so I'll, I will not get into it in uh, too much details. Just the main point is we can actually separate the center of mass and the intrinsic wave function uh, by using it. And then instead of using the old wave function that has been shown before, we'll actually take this B value to be zero. And then there is some uh, mathematical proof that I will not get into, uh, but it actually shows some idea which is not really surprising, which is that you can uh, sum over one less axis uh, or in, in those shifts. If you, actually, if you have one less axis in your coordinate system, then you can, you, you can uh, kind of avoid, avoid some of the summation. And this is, uh, and still, like in another integral, you get analytically calculatable metric element. Uh, now I will speak really fast about the advantage of Jacobi coordinates and we'll switch to question and we'll go to the questions part. So the advantage is really that you get more accurate result because when you don't define the uh, exact location of the center of mass of the system anymore, then actually from uncertainty principle, you don't give any uh, momentum to the center of mass, which creates an unnecessary and unwanted energy. And more than that, you actually get much faster um, metric element calculation because you need to sum over to be a max plus one less times. And actually you have less parameters that you need to optimize uh, as we saw before, and it's actually saves some time as well. Um, so I will here keep a, a slide with a summary of what I did, but, and you can see it while you, like uh, while we will go to that question part. All right, thank you very much for, for this talk. Uh, I, I found that strategy of dynamic, what you call BMAX, right? The neighboring boxes, uh, very interesting, very smart. Um, do we have any questions? Uh, Tobias, go ahead. Hi, it's more a curiosity. Uh, can you apply this uh, periodic boundary condition to the situation that you squeeze one side more than the other, not to a, uh, I mean, a perfect box, but uh, a kind of layer that you, is that possible just to, how I say, simulate the squeezing of the system, this is possible, or you need you, to have perfect box. Why do you mean by squeezing? Using a, a, a shape with paradigm boundary condition, which is not a box, like a sphere, something like that? No, 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 no. Just instead of having exactly a box, no, with all the sides, the three sides equal, you you just have one of the side <laughs> smaller, for example. Uh -huh. Then you are in some way squeezing in one direction. So in general, I did not uh, got into it here. I can I actually have I still have the slide, so I can I, I will just even without it. But no, uh, it's more if a curiosity you, if this is possible. So <laughs> in general, I be, I believe it should be but it will require us not to take the assumption that I took at the beginning, which is that the wave function at each axis is the same. Here we said like that the okay. psi x equals psi y equals psi z. If we do it, well, I guess we'll have to really like, um, we'll have to uh, optimize them separately and, and assume that they are different and only then yes. it will be possible. But more than that, I, I believe that, like in the that in the calculation of the potential, uh, you, you can uh, calculate uh, vx, vy, and vz uh, differently thank using uh, different delts. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Maybe it can be of use to when you have particles in a trap, and then <laughs> we start to squeeze the trap. You know? This is interesting. A problem. Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, I see that Emmanuel has a question. Mm, yes, I'm a little lost because you, 
are talking about lattice QCD, but it seems like in the talk you use a kind of Hamiltonian formalism. But lattice QCD is usually not, I mean, formulated as Hamiltonians with uh, uh, potentials. So can you say something about that? <laughs> yeah. So I actually try to to avoid this topic, not to uh, help, not to confuse people. Uh, but it, it's it's a really important point. Actually, uh, the potential that we uh, have in the simulation should be for effective field theory, uh, which is in the degree of freedom of neutron and protons. And for example, people, if there is really a simulation of uh, nine quarks, which are helium three, then we will we'll, I will actually switch to it. Uh, um, the second was really like on the the Hamiltonian was really on the first uh, on this slide. Then here we uh, we can actually have um, the coefficient with the uh, spin and isospin parts of of the parallel CFT, and maybe to add some three body force, and and with that we actually could get some uh, and, and we'll be able to actually um, extract the values of uh, each of those uh, pineal CFT coefficient uh, directly by matching it uh, with those system. That, does it like make any sense to you or help mm -hmm. you? Well, I understand what you say, but it means that uh... I mean that you, the method is not really possible to apply. I mean, in quantum field theory, as I understand. Can you repeat? I mean, the Hamiltonian you showed now. I mean, is non-relativistic, right? Yes. But in lattice QCD and other quantum field theories, I mean, you have uh, uh, relativistic. I mean, you don't have a non-relativistic Hamiltonian. So I don't see how you can apply this, uh, I mean, to lattice, to QCD, lattice QCD. Generally, it should be just a, a Hamiltonian to describe few like neutron proton system. I, I it's it shouldn't be a, it's quite standard to just uh, have like a few coefficient would describe an extremely short range correlation, and then uh, this exponential should be actually the uh, the like after regulator on uh, on the momentum because. Uh, what potential that you get, like because the and the system, the potential should be really narrow. Then you can switch it by like this Gaussian, and and we're discussing like low and energy. I'm I'm, I'm not sure I, I understand. Uh, uh, may well, I? This is the same. Let, let me just give the answer. It's the same procedure that you do when you construct a nuclear Hamiltonian based on data on experimental data. But instead of using experimental data, in this case, you just use the lattice data as your input. That's the only difference. Okay. Okay, I think I understand. Yeah. And there is one more point uh, that I see that the size of your lattice, I mean, the, the volume, sorry, is uh, pretty big. So this gives the chance to the nucleon to be formed. The nucleon is about one fermi. And I see what you are looking is 10 uh, or large uh, uh, sizes, no? So already maybe you are looking to the effect of the lattice that is with the size of the box larger than the size of the nucleon. So you do not go into the size of the nucleon, I think. No, you have 
L, uh, I don't know, five fermions or even larger. When it gets really to, to extremely close to the box, the cyber's limit completely uh, explode. You, you can get results in, in, this, uh, in, in this area as well, but it's uh, it, just there it was matched to the sizes of boxes that Lattice QCD people are using. If, if they were using the smaller ones, then I, I guess it would be really required to, to deal with that as well. Yeah, because then you enter in the size of the nucleon, so your yeah. degrees of freedom. I mean, it's not any more nuclear on the grid of freedom, I believe. So when you have big box, okay, is the nuclear on the grid of freedom. Okay, I think we have time for just one quick question. If somebody has one, uh, I see one raised hand. Who is it? Uh, uh, Paolo? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, yes, I have a question about. Uh, I have an issue with the microphone. Uh, now, now we can. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, uh. Paul, can you maybe, actually? Yeah, maybe you can write on the chat, and then uh, Ray can answer you later. Not really, we, we can't really hear. Yeah. Okay, so if we have any more questions, please uh, uh, write to, uh, to Roy uh, directly. Uh, thank you, Roy, for your uh, talk. Thank you for listening. Um, uh, is Pavel here, the next speaker? Pavel Belov. Uh, Lucas. Yes, he he sent an email that he could have problems, and uh, I believe probably he <laughs> he's not able to make yeah, to have connection. All right. So what should we do? Should we go to the next speaker then? Yes, I think Eloisa is here, and then Derek. All right, uh, Eloisa, can you uh, can you give your talk right now? Uh, yeah, 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 of course. Oh, I, I can. So okay, now we so have. I will uh, mm -hmm. share my screen. Okay, so now we have oh, Luisa yeah. Cuestas. She's from the National University of Cordoba in Argentina. And she's going to talk about strongly bound fermion pairs on a ring a composite boson approach. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to share our work. And also, uh, my internet connection is not very stable, so if we if we have some troubles, maybe I will have to turn off my camera. But, um, okay, this is the outline of the talk. First, I would like to briefly introduce our group and our approach, which is known as composite boson or co-boson formalism. Then I would like to mention our research line just in a few words. And after that, we are going to speak about um, our last work in which we focus on strongly bound fermions uh, on a ring. And then we will finish with a summary and some comments. So uh, after the talk, I would like to you to have a mental picture on how do we work and what topics do we work on? Um, why do we choose to work on these topics and with this uh, particular approach? So um, I am working in a kind of new group at the National University of Cordoba in Argentina. My postdoc advisor is Anna Magde here. She comes from the quantum information area. And we collaborate with Alex Bouvry from Spain, who comes more from the atomic and molecular physics or fibody physics area, uh, like me. We also collaborate with uh, Cecilia Cormit, who has a lot of experience in ultra cold atoms. The work I'm going to speak about is our last work uh, with uh, Ceci. We come from different uh, research lines, but we share the theoretical approach, which we complement with uh, numerical simulations. And 
as I said before, we work with something called the composite boson or co-boson ansatz. This ansatz was introduced in 2001 by Leggett for uh, bosons and by Monique Combescott for fermions. Here you have some uh, references. The co-boson ansatz proposed an expression for the ground state of a system with uh, certain properties, properties that we will uh, see in short. And I'm sure you uh, have already been in touch with the basic idea of the ansatz that is to treat a composite particle such as an atom or a nuclei or a molecule as if they were um, ideal bosons. The simple case will be then to have um, two bosonic or fermionic particles making a new uh, composite entity that behaves as an elemental uh, boson. This strategy to do with composite particles is a widely uh, used strategy in many body physics and it is justified a posteriori. This means that it is uh, justified because of its success, because it works. And works in the sense that it allows to predict and manipulate uh, the behavior of physical systems. Um, when we think in fermionic particles, the underlying idea is that if we exchange two, fermion, two fermions, uh, the total wave function must be anti-symmetric under, under that uh, exchange. But if we make that exchange twice, two and two fermions, the total wave function must be symmetric uh, just like in uh, the case of uh, bosons. <clears throat> then uh, we can think in two fermionic particles like a bosonic uh, entity. Of course, when we use this uh, formalism with fermions, we must take into account the Pauli exclusion principle, which in my opinion makes uh, things more uh, interesting. Um, I think the main goal of Monique Combescott, the mother of the Coboson ansatz for, for fermions, uh, was to show that even in the presence of strong fermionic correlations, the Coboson ansatz um, is able to capture the, physic, uh, the physics of the system. And um, here uh, are our general goals as a group. Um, so one of our, our main goals is to uh, actually to test these this ansatz to see if it works. So that's why we are always uh, looking for concrete application in experimentally achievable system in order to contrast uh, the results obtained using the ansatz with, uh, with measurements. One example of uh, such a system uh, will, uh, are the ultra gold uh, Fermi gases. So, as I said before, our group members come from different areas, and one of that area is uh, quantum information. And that's why we are um, interested in the role of entanglement on the uh, ideal bosonic behavior of composite particles. So we could then formulate uh, two uh, questions that guide our work. Uh, first, a very fundamental question about under which conditions uh, a pair of fermions can be treated as an, an ideal or elementary boson. And uh, it turns out that some authors have explored these questions and uh, found that or point out that the key to understand the origin of composite behavior uh, relies on entanglement. And the, the other question, the second question, is related to the extent of this a particular formalism. This is uh, when we can uh, use it and when we can't. So the, um, the concrete results I will show you in some minutes are more related to this uh, second question. Uh, but before going to that results, um, let me um, uh, make a brief uh, review of the Cobosan approach. The, uh, the main idea of this uh, of the Cobosan ansatz uh, formulated by this uh, author uh, Law is to build the unpolarized state of an even number of particles of two different species upon the single pair ground state, which is uh, therefore a two particle state. Um, for us, the two particles will be distinguishable, meaning that we have two different 
kind of particles, A and B, or red and uh, blue. That could be, for instance, uh, electrons of different spines in, in a model with no spin flips, or atoms in different hyperfine states. But the whole system must be uh, unpolarized. We must have the same amount of uh, red particles and blue particles. So in the description proposed by Law, um, the pairing structure is explicitly used, and the uh, many body observables can be obta obtained in terms of the single particle state. And that, uh, in my opinion, makes the results more uh, intuitive or imaginable. So um, giving a kind of cobosonic recipe, first we need to find a very good single particle state. And with very good, I mean to look for a state in which the interparticle interactions are taken into account in the best way as uh, possible. Then we need to find that the composition of the state reflecting the pairing structure between the type, the different types of uh, particles and uh, in terms of the single particle state here. Um, this is called the Schmidt decomposition of the state and it says that if we have a particle of kind A uh, or red particle in a given single particle state labeled by um, J, then we uh, have a blue or B particle in the J state, but of uh, the uh, blue particle. Um, based on that, uh, the composition of the uh, single per state, we define the uh, Cobosan creation operator here that creates a pair of these two different particles, like a new uh, entity, and it um, when doing that, we have into account uh, that when uh, we are uh, creating the particles and filling up the single particle states, we must obey the Pauli exclusion uh, principle. The state of n of uh, such uh, pairs comes from successive uh, pair creations from the vacuum, this V uh, uh, here and requires a normalization constant here in uh, red. This normalization constant has the information about the exchange correlations between particles of the same species, but among the different uh, pairs or, or the different cobosons. This sum here is performed in uh, uh, over different states uh, um, in order to fulfill the Pauli exclusion principle. And it turns out that when the, this ratio here between, um, between the normalization constant goes to one, the coboson behaves as um, like ideal independent and non-interacting bosons. Uh, uh, in contrast, if this uh, ratio is close to zero, then uh, it means that um, it reveals a strong deviation from of the ideal bosonic behavior, meaning that the fermionic character of the constituent of the A and B particles uh, becomes important. So when uh, using the Cobosan ansatz, uh, the many particle physics aris arises from uh, the state of a single pair and also um, from the fermionic exchange correlations. So in other words, the interparticle interaction beyond the exchange correlation uh, beyond the exchange interactions are only being considered in the initial two-body model for the uh, single pair. And that's why it is uh, so important for us to have a good model for the uh, single pair. And that's why we spend a lot of, of time and put a lot of effort to obtain and understand the two uh, particle states. Um, there is a connection between the amount of entanglement between the constituents of these uh, pair entities or cobosons and their, their ideal uh, be bosonic behavior. Um, in, in a few words, um, Lo found that the composite particles can be treated as bosons when they are sufficiently uh, entangled. And this is equivalent to two things. First, the effective number of available single particle states must be large compared to the total number of composite particles. And second, the available physical um, space 
um, for each pair must be large compared to the pair size. In other words, we need to have enough um, single particle state to accommodate all the particles, and we also have need to have a, enough a physical space to have to host all the pairs. And we can think this uh, as an egg saver here. Um, so the cobosons will be the eggs, and the states will be the places in the egg saver. So if we have uh, at most uh, 12 eggs and uh, we can accommodate them all and we are okay. But we have, if we had more than 12 eggs, uh, we will have a, a problem. Also, everything will work if we uh, have a chicken eggs, but if we had a big dinosaur egg, uh, this is not going uh, to work. So what this uh, entanglement related hypothesis says is that if the blue and red or A and B particles are sufficiently entangled, then we have a good say, uh, egg saver for the um, egg type and also for the number of eggs that we are dealing uh, with. So we can accommodate our cobosons in the state space as well as in the actual physical space. And uh, as a personal comment, this understanding or addressing composition from many areas or many point of views is what I like the most about this formalism and uh, what keeps me always uh, motivated. Um, I think I will uh, skip these slides, but um, let me um, say that, well, in order to test the answers, we are always looking for concrete applications on experimentally observed systems depicting strong fermionic correlations and also systems that uh, were widely studied with other theoretical approach in order to do the comparison between uh, the measurements and also with other theories um i will skip this on this one so um the Kovosan ansatz is ex uh, expected to be valid for short-range interactions, dilute systems, and highly entangled constituents. But it turns out that in this um, paper here, part of our group studied uh, strongly bound composite bosons in a discrete lattice and showed that the ansatz fails in a one-dimensional uh, model. And the ansatz fails because it is not able to capture the correlation, the long range uh, correlations of the system. Um, in a two dimensional lattice, the ANSAT works. So one of the main conclusions of this uh, paper is that the dimensionality plays a crucial role. But we still wonder what happens with a, a continuous system. And that leads us to to focus on the case of two fermion pairs on a ring of length uh, L, where the uh, red and blue fermions interact with a delta attractive potential. Um, the correct ground state for this uh, system is uh, well known. The ground state energy can be found, for, uh, for, instance, for example, in this uh, reference here and um, is, is here. Uh, so we wanted to compare this uh, known energy with the cobosonic energy. The energy for the ground state of n pairs that is estimated using the ansatz has as a main contributions um, the, uh, the energies for one and two pairs here. So uh, to compare the true ground state with the one of the ansatz, we, we, we follow this, uh, these uh, steps. So first we solve the two-body or single pair state, uh, and then uh, we build the creation operator for a single pair. Then with having this uh, creation operator, we uh, build the two cobosome bases, uh, and at this point, we reach the, the, the two pair or four particle pa uh, part of the work. Um, then we calculate, oh, here is in blue. Um, then we calculate the over, uh, overlap and, mat and Hamiltonian matrix um, elements. And with uh, those matrices, we, uh, we find uh, the um, ground state, the four particle 
ground state. And uh, having this uh, ground state, we calculate the fidelity between the two ground state and the one given by the ansatz, and we also calculate the um, correlations. Um, to solve the two-body two -body state, the state of uh, a single pair, uh, we rewrite the Hamiltonian in the center of mass and relative coordinates. And uh, um, by doing this, the Hamiltonian decouples and the wave function is a product of the uh, a center of mass state and a relative state. As we can see here, the solution for the center of mass states are the uh, free particle state. Um, the relative states can also be uh, exactly obtained, and when the interaction increases, the interaction becomes more and um, more attractive, the gram uh, relative states becomes more and more localized. That will be going from this black curve here to the blue one here. And uh, for strong attractive interaction, we can approximate the relative state with this simple expression here. And um, we can see that the fidelity between the complete ground state and its approximation goes to one for strong uh, uh, interaction. Remember that the fidelity is the square modulus of the projection between the states, so it's a measure on how um, similar the states uh, are. And here we can see that the uh, energy is also well approximated by, by this uh, expression. Um, we could also obtain the exact uh, Schmidt decomposition of the two body single pair ground state. And uh, having this, we uh, were able to corroborate that this two-body state fulfills all the criteria that, uh, well, the, all the criteria mm, that we know, mm, the criteria to the best of our knowledge, that have been proposed for a good bosonic behavior. And here uh, we can see that the two-body, the two particles, the blue and red particles, are highly entangled. The linear entropy goes to one uh, for a sufficiently uh, strong uh, attraction. Um, the system also fulfills some criteria uh, for good bosonic behavior based on physical ideas like this one uh, for each of the Schmidt coefficients that uh, are these coefficients here, um, which comes from the notion that uh, low density prevents the overlap between the wave function uh, of the fermionic constituents, and therefore uh, the fermionic character will not be uh, important. Um, once we had the two particle state, we built the creation operator for a, a single pair, uh, like this. And uh, here this, this operator creates a fermion of kind uh, or type uh, A at position uh, X. Having this creation operator, we build the two cobosome bases. And because of the symmetry of the problem, and since we are looking for the ground state, we can restrict ourselves to this space with a zero, <clears throat> zero pseudo momentum so that the ground state will have this uh, form here, uh, where this AKM is uh, cut off while the uh, cobosonic uh, state will be this one here. So uh, all the coefficients are, uh, will be zero, um, but the, the, the first one. Um, with the two coboson bases, we uh, must then calculate the overlap matrix. And um, in this step, we uh, just must uh, use the, um, the the commutation and decommutation relations, and uh, after that, we need to solve the, the remaining integrals. Um, the complete exact expression is uh, this one, and it's it's not important. But the important thing here is that for a very strong attraction, we can expand this uh, exact ex expression um, in this small parameter and 
we um, obtain a um, quite simple expression. We can also compute the um, complete exact expression for the Hamiltonian uh, matrix elements and also expand it on the same uh, small um, parameter here. So with the exact matrix elements, we can solve the generalized, generalized eigenvalue system uh, numerically. And with the Taylor expansions, we can obtain some exact, uh, exact results. But before we go to, to those uh, results, we are ready to compute the cobosonic estimation for the energy of the four particle ground state. And we can see that there is a very, very large correction to this um, term, this one, that corresponds to uh, the ground state of two non-interacting pairs. So the Gobosan ansatz is not giving us the correct uh, four-particle ground uh, state energy. Even though the ansatz, ansatz fails, with the Taylor expansion um, in the Hamiltonian and overlap uh, matrix elements, we could reobtain the uh, exact correction for the ground uh, state energy. And we could also obtain the exact uh, coefficients. So, Eloisa, you those... have a couple of minutes to, to conclude. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I have a clock here. Thank you. Um, with the coefficients, we could calculate the exact fidelity, which um, is not quite good, but it is in agreement with the results, uh, with the previous results uh, found in the one dimensional lattice model. And then we calculate the conditional probability of finding a particle of kind A at position X when another particle of the same kind was found at a position at zero position and it gives this a uh, simple expression here which um, disagrees from the cobosonic one here um, so uh, we can see that the correct probability uh, this uh, red one here is uh, very smooth and the cobosonic uh, probability conditional probability is quite flat and has this abrupt decay here uh, in zero. Mm. In zero, both uh, probabilities must be, must be zero because uh, two fermions of the same species cannot be at the, at the same position. So <clears throat> from these plots, we can see that we obtain a, a very good agreement uh, between the analytical results, uh, the both uh, in red, and the numerical results in uh, blue. The numerics is uh, quite easy and very efficient with a um, really small basis. Uh, we can obtain a great agreement with the exact results. So uh, the main conclusions are uh, first that the ansatz does uh, not give a good approximation for the ground state. It does not capture the proper uh, spatial correlations between pairs, but uh, um, even though it, uh, the answer fails, we could show how using elements of the Cobosan formalism, using the Cobosonic uh, basis, basis uh, we could recover the correct uh, ground state. Um, so uh, as a global conclusion and beyond this uh, particular case, I will say that the Cobosan formula is, is a powerful tool to address a few uh, particle systems. So uh, thank you very much. And um, here are our emails, just in case, and um, a picture of each one of the, of the people that have been involved in our group. And also, if um, there is no, no problem with that, a friend asked me to invite you to this uh, conference on quantum foundations um, in case uh, 
you find it interesting. And the conference would be an online conference and there is no, no re registration fee and the time would be uh, Buenos Aires time. Okay. Uh, Eloisa, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, do we have any questions? I see that uh, Paolo has raised his hand, but probably regarding the, the last question. Okay. Um, uh, Marcelo? Eloisa, uh, I think I missed something in your presentation. Uh, what are the restrictions to treat uh, a systems like uh, with the co-boson uh, mm -hmm. approximation? Um, well, the restriction in, in what sense? I, I can say that um, in, uh, what are the... I, I mean, the, the density of your system should be considered. The, I, I don't yeah, know the, the density, it, the, the... the system must be, yeah, the system must be dilute and also the interactions must be short range. And uh, another requirement uh, is that the amount of entanglement between these, uh, these different uh, uh, species must be high. Yeah. And uh, from another of our works, yeah, we, uh, we saw also that, um, for example, we uh, from from that conditions we expect that the answer must work for highly attractive interactions so uh, the answer should work for a more like a molecular state but uh, we also have a, a good results for a repulsive interaction for example and that's that's um and in that case the answers also work because uh, the two different particles were uh, has like a, a maximum entanglement entanglement so yeah i don't know if if that okay, answer your but, question uh, is there a, a, any restriction that uh, maybe it's a naive question that uh, forbids your system of cobosal system to to condense to have a condensate of cobosons is it possible or not like a co-boson yeah. Einstein condensate. Mm, well, that's something um, like uh, a strict condition, uh, uh, an easy condition um, preventing um, the Bosch Einstein condensate will be not to have a, a sufficiently um, a sufficient amount of um, single particle uh, state to accommodate all the particles. For example, if your if the dimension of your uh, of your Hilbert state is uh, less than the number of particles you uh, have, then you won't have a uh, Bose Einstein condensate, and that's quite easy to see with this uh, with this formalism. Uh, and it's related to the to the density to ask for a low density. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, in three dimensions, that would be the BC side of the BCS BC crossover, right, Louise? Yeah. Uh, in one yeah. D, uh, I, I don't know much. Um, Tobias, do you have a question? Yes, I mean, uh, thank you, Eloisa, for, for the talk. Uh, it's nice to see this activity in, in Argentina. So was, I'm really glad uh, to have you here. Uh, my question is uh, quite simple. I mean, I was just wondering, when you increase the strength of your interaction, you know, at some point, the bound state that you have become very small to see the curvature of your cycle. So this should be 1D system, essentially. Yeah. Well, the, this is a, a 1D system with, with periodic boundary conditions. Yeah, yeah. But, but even, I mean, would, 
when, you, when the system is very small, then essentially you don't care about the boundary condition anymore because mm -hmm. it's too small. I mean, it's strongly bound. So yeah. I was wondering if you have checked the limit of your calculations uh, comparing just with a 1D uh, problem. I mean, in a line for the strongly bound case when the size yeah. of the bound state is much smaller than the diameter, for example. Well, that is exactly this. Uh, this uh, is the ground state ah, for the, okay. pro the problem you are saying, and we could uh, recover this extra exact expression, but not mm -hmm. using the answer itself, but uh, doing this like uh, this um, variational approach with the with the with the Hamiltonian. I don't know if variation is the word, but uh, I, with, with that I mean to to look for this uh, to look for the matrix elements of the Hamiltonian and the overlap matrix matrices and solve this uh, generalized uh, eigenvalue equation. Okay. Yeah. Maybe be, then this co boson is possible. Maybe it's not that good if the system is too small. No, you need a more larger system. Maybe. No. But okay, uh, thank you, Eloise. Okay. Um, I will stop sharing. Uh, any more questions? Okay. Uh, if not, thank you again, Eloisa. Um, okay, uh, thank I'll, you. I would just like to let uh, Rui and uh, Nir know that Paolo left uh, a question to, to them in the chat. I tried to answer, but please make sure the answer is correct. Um, uh, yes, I answer in uh, after the private reasons in one two. Oh, okay. The talk. Oh, okay, thanks. And uh, is Derek here? Yes, yes. He's here. Okay, so let's move on to our next speaker, uh, Derek dos Santos Rosa. Uh, he is uh, from ITA in, in Brazil. And he's going to talk about the dimensional aspects of the FMOV effect. Okay, let me just share my screen here. Are you guys seeing my yes. presentation? Yes, we can okay. see. Okay, uh, let me just save some internet here all right okay um, okay so thank you the organizers for the opportunity to speak here uh, i will start this short talk uh, with a historical context of the fmov effect just to be self-contained all right so i will start in 1935 with thomas so he was basically studying a three-body system in the context of nuclear physics. So he had two neutrons with vanishing interaction between them and a proton which interaction, which interact with the two neutron uh, attractive until a finite range and vanished after some length, all right? So what Thomas saw is that if you look to the ground state of your three body system in the limit of zero range of the interaction, your system is unbounded from below, right? So for me, Thomas was looking kind of one of the first features of the FMOV effect, right? He was for me basically looking to the ground state of the FMOV uh, physics, all right? So 35 years later, uh, FMOV was studied three identical atoms, so kind of similar to what Thomas did in terms of the mass configuration of the system. Uh, FMOV considered that each of the, the, the pair of particles was bounded with the two body bound energy, and they had uh, the interaction with an effective range R0. Right? So, what FMOV found is that if you take the limit of zero, bound and two body bound energy or the scattering length to infinite, 
you find an infinite number of bound states to your three body system, right? But not only that, and then looking to the highest excited state, he saw that if you take ratios of the three body bound energy, well, you find a constant, right? This constant is called the FMOV parameter. Well, already for a mass imbalance system uh, in 1973, FMOV found that this FMOV parameter depends on the mass configuration of your system. So in this figure here, uh, if you consider all the three pair of particles to be resonant, this is what the FMOV parameter is going to behave with the mass ratio. The dashed line here is kind of what F, uh, Thomas did. So you don't have interaction between one of the pairs, so no resonance for one of the pairs. Well, it didn't take too long uh, to the community to ask what is the different aspect that impacts the FMOV physics, all right? So the dimension, for example, it's kind of a big deal, right? So in the 80s, Lim and Malhoni studying three identical atoms, considering resonance in all of the pairs, found that there is no FMOV effect in two dimensions. Well, in this reference here, you can kind of conclude the same thing, right? You can, for example, apply the born perheim approximation or short range uh, approach to solve your system, but the doesn't matter which is the mass configuration, the conclusion is the same. There is no FMOV effect in 2D. So far, for me, everything was kind of ideal, right? We are always talking about uh, infinite scattering length or zero effective range. So that's why I believe in the, in the early 90s, this work of FMOV is, is very important because you are kind of going to, into the direction of the experimental, right? So now you have finite range corrections, right? So your scattering length is not infinite anymore. It, neither is the, the range of your interaction. That's basically what you're going to have in your experiment nowadays. Uh, what, what also happened in the 90s is uh, the realization of the Bose-Eyes condensate and uh, the observation of the Feshbaugh resonance. So, for me, that's an important point because now you have the environment to measure the FMOV effect in the Bose-Eyes condensate and the tool, right, to tune the scattering length uh, so you can go to, not go to the entire regime because you are always going to have finite uh, scattering length, but you can see more FMOV three-body bound states. Well, with all the tools to measure the effect, it didn't take too long. Uh, in, in 2018, in the international conference, Ru Rudolf Green was telling a story about how they measured the FMOV effect, but didn't see in 2002, right? And, but they reported uh, this in uh, the, the first evidence of the FMOV effect in 2006. Uh, in this case, they have uh, three identical atoms, all right? If you are computing this theoretically, you have three identical atoms. Well, what happened in the early 20s also is the re realization of the Bose-Eyes condensate in lower dimensions. So now the environment where you measure the FMOV effects changing with the dimension, all right? So I believe that's kind of important point because after that you have a lot of different articles talking about dimensional effects in the FMOV physics, right? So you can do this in several ways. One of them is to consider your system in mixed dimensions like Nishida and Zhang did. So you basically have, for example, two of your three body particles live in two dimensions and the third one, you let it free to move in three dimensions, for example. Well, another different way to see this uh, impacts of the dimension is to consider your three body system embedded in an external potential, right? So what you, what you can basically do here is, you know, you can compute the three body energy has a function of this length, right? Which is basically saying to you how exquisite is your external traffic, right? So if you take this B to 
infinity, you are going the direction of the 3D. And if you take it to zero, you are going to into the direction of 2D. So you are squeezing your system um, from one side to, to other. Since you can compute the three body energy, well, you, you can extract here the FMOV parameter too, just taking ratios of this consecutive bound energy, right? But in this talk, I want to talk about a different way to study the, the impacts of the dimension in the FMOV effect, all right? And which is consider your system embedded in fractional dimensions, all right? So you are not putting in your computation d equals to three or like f of d or equals to two like lim, but you know, you change d uh, continuously from, for example, three dimensions to two or one. And you can compute things like we can show, I can show here in figure, uh, in this figure, right? So you basically have the three body energy, all right? Has a function of the uh, two body energy of their system with different dimensions, right, for different dimensions. But, uh, you know, just to motivate uh, some of the works that I did, I want to highlight this one here, right? So in this FISC report, Garrido and the group of Denmark, well, if you look at one of the section, they, they compute the aspects of the dimension, all right, in your system. So they, they are solving the three body system uh, in configuration space. So they are basically solving the Schrenk equation. And they are looking, of course, to the limit of the FMOV effect, right? And what they saw is that, well, the effect is not there for two dimension. You have the effect in three dimension, but uh, the FMOV effect is really vanishing in dimensions 2.3, if you consider three identical atoms in this case, with resonance and all those pairs, all right? Well, inspired by this work, uh, we had now a mass imbalance system, all right? So we are considering resonance and all the pairs, but we are not solving the configuration space, right? We will go to the momentum space to solve the Skorniakov and Thermotyrosan equations. So since we are looking to the FMOV effect, we are going to take the limit of infinite uh, scattering length, all right? So our two body energy is zero. And like FMOV did, we are looking to the highest excited state. So we are going to set the, the three body energies to zero here too. If you solve the, the, the couple of integral equations, you end with um, equation that gives you the FMOV parameter has a function of the dimension and the mass ratio, all right? Well, you can, you know, compute, when we build this figure here where we give the, the FMOV parameter has a function of the dimension and the mass ratio. So the dashed line, the black dashed line stands for dimensions equals to three, right? And uh, well, remember that here we are considered the system embedded in the D dimensions, all right? But you can also study the the impacts of the dimension, consider your three body system uh, under an external potential, right? So there you can compute the FMOV parameter has a function of that B, that if, if it's large, you are in 3D, if it goes to zero, you are basically in 2D. So compare the FMOV parameter from D dimensions and consider a system embedded in, with this in this external potential, you can come with a relation of the dimension with what you basically are going to have in your experiment, all right? Which is this, the aspect ratio of your trap. Well, we can find similar computation in this physical review research here of Carrido and Axel, right? They are, they are also given some relation of the dimension with the external trap. Well, since we can compute the FMOV parameter, we can also compute the boundaries for the, ex the existence of the FMOV effect, right? So that's what we have here. So if you have the mass ratio equals to one, so you basically have three identical atoms, your, the FMOV effect is going to, is to, to exist, right? From dimensions equals to 2.3 and 3.8, which reproduce the physics report of Garrido and the group from Denmark. But what we saw is that 
if you consider a mass imbalance system, for example, uh, two atoms of cesium and one atom of lithium, well, the, the boundary for the dimension is not 2.3 anymore, but 2.25. Well, since we are in the universal regime, the, you know, you are free all, all the scales of your system. It's hard to know what is happening, all right? So in order to answer or try to see some of the features of what is happening, why the FMOV effect is gone, we apply the Born-Oppenheim approximation in D dimension, consider a system of two half atoms and uh, one light one. So in this case, in this talk, I will consider no interaction between the two half ones, all right? And I will look to the regime well, well, where the scattering length between the light particle and the half one goes to infinity. So the two body bound energy here, it's zero. If you solve the Schrodinger equation for the light atom, well, you're going to find the effective potential, right? So this potential here is generates, a, this energy generates a potential between the two heavy atoms. So your three body system is kind of bounded because the presence of the light atom, right? So depending on how is this potential, your three body energy is going to, you know, change. Well, we, we did it, we computed, and if you look at the universal regime or taking the scale length to infinite, this potential, this effective potential, it's basically one over R squared, all right? With a strength depending on the dimension and the mass ratio. Well, at this point, I mean, let me just say, if you go to the Landau book, all right? There is this uh, section called fall to the center, right? So he basically studied what is the properties of this, what he called pathological potential, right? So if you try to solve the Schrodinger equation with the potential one over R squared, first you're going to see that your system is unbounded from below, all right? Which is kind of what we saw in 1935 with Thomas Collapse, but you're going to see that you have an infinite number of bound states too, all right? So you can apply the fault to the center uh, to this potential and you can compute the FMOV parameter has a function of the dimension, the mass ratio of your system. In this case here, we also have the angular momentum, right? But in this figure, I will set the angular momentum to zero, all right? And uh, compare our results here in the born oppenheim approximation with the ones that I just showed you, coming from this Korniakov thermaturazan equation, I solve the integral equation. Well, as expected, what we see is that if you make the light atom right lighter and lighter, well, the born oppenheim approximation goes to what we, we would call it to exact solution, right? Okay. Uh, but now let me just say about some of the works that we are doing right now, right? So uh, we are going to put this work on online. What we did here is to compute uh, the three body system, all right, for a mass imbalance system at uh, the universal regime. But we were able to compute not only the FMOV parameter solving the, the beta parse boundary condition, but also the three body wave function, all right? Well, at this point, I believe uh, that's kind of important because you now can compute different observables, all right? It has a function of the dimension. Uh, that you can use it to, to measure not only the FMOV effect, but how the dimension impacts um, this phenomenon, right? So inspired in this physical review letter of Eric Bratton, you know, what he said is the, is the following. So you, you can measure the FMOV effect, all right? Like Rudolf Grimm and the group of Innsbruck did, look into the loss of atoms in your trap, or you can just, Eric Bratton is proposing here, measure the spectroscopy, all right? So basically what you have to do is that you compute the, the density of your system, which is basically given by uh, an integral of your wave function. And at a high momentum, right? You, you can relate your density with the two body parameter and the three body parameter, right? Which this one is really related to the FMOV effect, right? And this two parameter, you know, they, they impact the, 
spectroscopy frequency that you can measure, right? So it's a different way to measure the FMOV effect, not looking to the FMOV parameter, right? So you're losing of atoms in your trap. Okay, uh, I just finished. Let me just take some minutes here to thank you Tobias and Marcelo, Gaston for the last eight years that we are working with. Thank you for the master degree and the opportunities. But you know, last two years was kind of a hard days in Brazil, right? Due to the pandemic and things like that. So all this competition, I mean, I did it at a lockdown and with only my wife and my son that was born last year. And I would like to thank also them for, you know, the company in the late, in the last two years, all right? Okay, uh, I'll finish here, right? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Derek, for this very nice presentation. Uh, questions? So I have a, a question, Derek, uh, that, okay. which is, my question is at the two body level because I, I'm more used to 3D. So uh, if we go back to Pascal Maidon's uh, lectures, um, so if we take this idea of uh, two particles with a purely attractive potential, so uh, no repulsion, just attraction, right? Okay. Uh, so in three dimensions, you could either have just scattering states or you can have one bound states two, and so on. Okay. So if you jump to two dimensions, so two, in two dimensions, just uh, a potential that's just attractive, uh, there is always a bound state uh, if yes. it's uh, just attractive. So yes. uh, maybe you can answer this. Um, if you could go continuously from 3D to 2D, but just at the two body level, uh, when this bound state would appear? Well, let me see if I understood. So if you are in three dimensions, look to the two body problem, you, you can have more than one bound state, all right? Or zero. Or zero, yeah. Yes. So, but in 2D, you have, for example, only one. So. Uh, no, no, well, uh, uh, at least one. At least one. At yeah. least one, yes. Let me just show one figure here to Because my, help me out. Uh, let me tell you well, uh, where I'm trying to go with this question. Uh, my naive uh, perception of this, uh, uh, what's going on here would be that uh, for the FMOF effect to appear, you need a, a, a uh, a two-body bound state with, well, zero energy. You need to be at the threshold. But when you okay. get to 2D, you can't do that because you always have a, a, a two-body bound state. So, so my naive impression would be, okay, the FMOV effect is spoiled uh, somewhere between 2 and 3D when this happens. Yeah, I mean, you are kind of, you are correct, right? You're Correct, but if I understood your your question was kind of what happened is transitional, right? Between having mm -hmm. those states in three dimension and have at least one in two. Yes. Right. Well, I'm not sure if I understood correctly, but in this figure here, of course we are in the three body context, but mm -hmm. what they are studying the transition between three dimensions to two dimension continuously, all right? Mm -hmm. So, so in, in three dimensions, you, you, you have the FMOV effect. So you have an infinite number of bound states here. Mm -hmm. If you start going to two dimensions, what you see is that the highest excited state goes to the continuum, all right? Because in 2D, you cannot have an infinite number of bound states. It, it, it will depend on the mass ratio that you are. So you have four, five, six, seven, eight bound states. But in 2D, that's what you're going to have, right? So maybe for the two-body problem, you have some similar 
All right. I guess because I mean what you just said is kind of related to the to the momentum angular, right? The 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 barrier that the momentum angular brings to the Schrang equation, all right? Because in 2D, if you take for example L equals to zero is attractive, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's why it's you have at least it's easier to bound the system in mm -hmm. two dimensions, all right? Well, but in this transition, I mean, I really don't know. I didn't the computation for the two body system, but it might happen some something similar to what we are seeing here, right? Uh, I, I don't know. As I said, this is a naive interpretation by me, and yeah, the sum of I, effects is gotta highly... be honest because in, you know I'm maybe giving you a naive answer too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but but thanks for the answer. I, I did learn something. Uh, any more questions? Uh, in different no? times, we could just go to take a, a walk in France and Germany. Everybody's at home right now at the end of the day. <laughs> okay, so let's thank uh, Derek again. Thank and, you. Uh, maybe the organizers want to say a few words to close the day. Uh, Tobias, Marcelo, would you like to say something? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Lucas. And uh, thank you very much, Derek, for your presentation. I don't have any, anything, any, anything more to say. And uh, just said that tomorrow we are back with the lectures uh, at nine. Tobias, okay, I think we can finish. Okay, thank you very much, Lucas. Oh, no problem, Marcel. Okay. See you tomorrow.